a man in Iran has a plan, but nobody knows what it is. And then we take a look at a bizarre new conspiracy that I just made up. Well, I didn't make it up. I just discovered, I meant to say. I'm not going to say that it answers the questions to everything, like I did yesterday's conspiracy theory, but I will say you will find yourself chilled to the bone when we take a look at the St. Bernard Conspiracy, today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. Insomnia is still in full swing. I'm recording this episode at 1 in the morning, which I think you expect most paranormal podcasts are recorded late at night. I normally do them in the sun. Normally do them in a nice sunny day, but I can't sleep, so I'm up. And here we go, we're recording today's episode. First off, let's give a shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, Rolf. Everyone, I'm pausing before I pronounce his name again. Everyone give a round of applause to, to, to Rolf. Oh, damn it. To Rolf. Sorry, bro. R-O-L-F. So it's like Wolf, but with an R in front of it. Longtime listeners of the show. I've been able to hide it for quite a while. Longtime listeners of the show know about my speech impediment. So thank you. <clears throat> so thank you, Rolf, Rolf, for bringing that once again to the forefront. <laughs> You're going to be our captain, or he's all standing there. No, no, come on, come on. It's okay. It's okay. He's a little ashamed <laughs> that he exposed this secret once again. Rolf, you're going to be our... <laughs> he's like, I don't, I don't want to be on this episode, bro. Come here. Come here. Rolf, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you can't support the Patreon, that's fine, too. Just help spread the word about the show. Really, really helps out a lot. So, Rolf... Ro- oh, dang it. This is going to be a long <laughs> episode. So, Rolf... And and actually, before we continue, let me go ahead. Today's Fan Art Friday, so you'll see that we have new art for today. And today's art is by Lux D. Wakari on Twitter. Friend of the show Lux created this artwork of Mormon Bigfoot. So I really appreciate it. It's totally awesome. We got a little classic Bigfoot pose holding the Book of Mormon a little tight. Really appreciate that, Lux. So that is our selection for Fan Art Friday. Okay, now Rolf. I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys to the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We are leaving behind the land of Sleepy Time, which I'm currently on the border of, and we are headed out to Iran. Dirigible is flying through the Sleepy Time Mountains, over the Sleepy Time Clouds, past Nap Gorge. I don't know, they ran out of names. The the map makers aren't very good in Sleepy Land. We're headed back to Iran. The year is 1990. There's a man named Hossein Sabzian. And Hossein is riding on the bus one day, like he normally does, just taking the bus. And he's holding a copy of the script for a movie called The Cyclist, made by a very famous director known as Mozan Makomblov. He's a huge cinema fan. He loves cinema. I love cinema too, but you'll never catch me walking around with a script for Cheerleader Massacre 2 or any of my other favorite movies. Might wear a Transformer shirt, but that's, that's beside the point. This guy really, really loves movies, and he has a script for one of the movies of one of Iran's most famous directors, and he's on the bus. And there's a woman next to him, and she goes, oh, oh, you know, you have that book. You have the book. Give me the book. It's the only copy of the script they're shooting the movie across town. She's like, oh, you have that book, The Cyclist. You have that script. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. I am happen to be holding the script for The Cyclist. So the movie had come out like three years earlier. Again, it wasn't Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. They weren't trying to get the script to the director. It was like a published version of the script. The woman's like, oh, you know, I'm a huge fan of that movie, The Cyclist. And... This is what fascinates me about this story, is the split-second decisions. When she goes, hey, I really, really like that movie, Hossein, who's a film fan, a film fanatic, turns to her and says, oh, I'm glad you liked it. I directed it. She's like, what? And he goes, my name is Mosin Maklaboff. She's like, I'm pretty sure that's not how you pronounce the name. So I think you're defrauding me. But she doesn't pick up on it because he actually pronounces it correctly. She's like, oh, my. He's like, yeah, I'm actually just taking this bus because, you know, my chauffeur, I gave him the day off. So I'm on this bus today. But I directed this movie. That is why I have this script that you could buy at Barnes & Noble. But I loved it so much I went and bought it at Barnes & Noble. 
So he begins to pass himself off as this famous director. Now, this is 1990, so it's not like she could pull out her phone if she was suspicious and, like, hold up a picture of him or anything like that. And also, she's probably just taking him at his word. She definitely takes him at his word because she invites him home. This woman, she's a married woman with two kids, says, hey, why don't you come home? And my kids love film. They actually want to be in movies. And he's like, oh, great, I'll put him in my next movie. So he's, his deceit, the first thing was just kind of a knee-jerk reaction, but now he's building on this deceit. He starts hanging out of the house. He starts hanging out at the house of the Anaka family. So he's meeting there, he's meeting, that was Mrs. Anaka. He's meeting the kids. He's like, oh, you guys want to be in movies? They're like, oh yeah, movies are super dope. He's all, he's all hyping them up. He's like, hey, let's do some casting. Let's like figure this stuff out. He's like bringing in green screens and stuff like that. He's hyping them up. He's saying, oh yeah, I'm going to put you in this movie. And I should be fair. These movies, like I read the synopsis of the movie, The Cyclist. Like if a director came to my house and was like, hey, you want to be in the new G.I. Joe movie? I'd be like, yeah, dope, dude. But this guy made like art films and stuff. He made a movie called The Cyclist about this dude in Afghanistan who was trying to pay for his wife's medical treatment. Sounds fascinating, but I wouldn't want to be in it. Kind of boring. (laughs) Even though it's about the (laughs) the human condition. This guy in Afghanistan is super poor and he's trying to pay for his wife's medical condition. He used to be an endurance athlete. And at one point, he tries faking his death by hiding under a car, and they find him. They're like, dude, we just saw you crawl under the car. Obviously, crawling under the car doesn't kill you unless Pennywise is under there. The circus promoter says, tell you what, you can raise money for your dying wife if you ride a, this is so bizarre. If you ride a bicycle around in a circle for seven days straight, like, we'll make a big promotion of it. And you can raise money for your wife. So it's about this poor Afghanistani dude. Riding a bicycle around in a circle for seven days. That's the whole movie. The movie's not seven days long. Don't worry. It's like two hours. But he's riding the bike around in the circle, and then people start setting up vendor shops around him, and it becomes this big circus, which is what the promoter expected. And then you have people show up and gamble on him, and people are, like, trying to sabotage him and stuff like that. And he has, like, this IV bag, and he's just riding his bike. He can't sleep. His eyes are propped open, I I guess. I, I think they'd have to be. He just rides around in a circle for seven days, and at the ending... I watched the ending. He's riding around the circle so many times that he's exhausted. He's done the seven days, but he's so exhausted. He can't hear everyone going, you did it, you did it, stop, stop. And like some little dude runs out of the crowd and is like trying to get him off the bike to like, but he can't. He's stuck in that cycle. And then his, spoiler alert, I'm pretty sure his wife dies because they show her going, which is the universal sign of somebody dying, right? When they go, Maybe she just had a sprite. I don't know. Ah, And it was a translation error. But the point is, is that like he was trapped in that cycle and how society was using him. Fascinating. I wouldn't want to be in it. It's not my type of movie. And now if in that movie he's riding a bicycle around and then like two feet away, there's when cheerleaders getting massacred. I'm in. I'm in. So, but these kids are like, oh yeah, dude, we totally love like Paul Thomas Anderson and all that art house garbage. Let's be in this. Let's totally do this. I like Paul Thomas Anderson. But, it's just going to be black and white. And he's like, of course, it's going to be. Yes, awesome. Woo. No one's going to watch this movie. It's going to be great. And this goes on for about two weeks. He keeps swinging by the house. And he's like, hey, guys, want to talk about that movie that we're going to make? <laughs> That's so funny. How can you keep pulling off this fraud? How does he not feel super guilty every time he walks into that house? He's just making up these lies. And there's one person who, who knows that this dude's lying. It's the dad of the family, Mr. Anakar is like, this dude's not a director. This dude's not a, I'm, I can guarantee. Oh no, why are you being so mean, Bill? It goes to the point where he finds a journalist who apparently had worked with Mosin or had covered him at some point. Because again, you couldn't pull up the internet and show photos and be like, it's obviously not him. They did have a, the dad, we'll call him Bill, did go get a magazine and brought it home and goes, look, here's a picture. This guy is way younger than the dude in our living room. Oh, Bill. Would be in such a spoil sport. You'll never be in the movie if you get. <laughs> of course, I'm not going to be in the movie. There is no movie. Bill eventually brings a journalist into his house and he goes, Hey, do I have a story for you? There's a guy who keeps swinging by my house pretending to be the famous film director Mosin. The journalist comes in and they're just kind of waiting around. The journalist is like, When's he going to get here? Are you sure he's coming? And <laughs> Bill's like, Yeah, he's coming. He comes all the time. Sure enough, front door opens. Hossein walks in. And the the journalist is like, that is 100% not that film director. 
So they call the cops, and the journalist is just sitting there the whole time, drinking his tea like some sort of Bond villain, because the second the cops show up, the journalist begins taking photos of this man getting yanked out of the house for fraud. That was a big story in the newspaper that day. Now, in another part of Iran, there was a film director named Abbas Kiristami. He's making a movie. He's making probably some black and white art house movie about, I don't know, the human condition. <laughs> Something I wouldn't watch. Something I wouldn't watch. I'd watch one about the Transformer condition. He's across town, he's shooting this movie, and he's reading the newspaper at the same time. Not a very good director. They're like, aren't you going to see what's going on? Nah, I'm reading the newspaper today. He's reading the newspaper, and he reads this article about Hussein and about the family and about pretending to be the director. And a boss goes, okay, guys, um, this movie's done. <laughs> We're not making this movie anymore. We're putting it on hold. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? He's like, there's a movie I have to make right now. I don't think Hussein was thrown in jail, but he was charged with fraud. And that was a sticky issue because the only thing that he actually, like, got from them was at one point he asked one of the sons for cab fare home. Which, you know, what is that, like 20 bucks? Something like that, 15 bucks? The, the idea was that he was planning on defrauding them for a large amount of money. That, that was kind of the working theory. But I don't think he was in jail. I think they arrested him and they're like, you gotta come back to trial. I'm not really sure how the Iranian justice system works. But a boss does visit Hussein and he goes... Hey, I want to make a movie about I want to make a movie about what's going on right now, but I need you to do something. I need you to rush the trial because I got another movie. They're still thinking I'm on the set. He made a big like dummy out of straw and put it in the director's chair and they're like, a boss, how do you like this shot? How do you there's a little tape recorder, good shot, move on. He's like, dude, I gotta like finish that other movie, but I want to shoot this one, so you need to move the trial date up. Then he talks to the judge and he goes, Hey, can I put cameras in your courtroom? And the judge is like, Yeah, you know, sure. A boss goes to the family and says, hey, how would you guys like to be in a movie? So that goes to trial, and the judge is looking at all this stuff. He sees this young man. He's a father. Hussein's a father. And he goes, you know, there really no crime took place. Yeah, he borrowed some money. He goes, can we drop the charges? He asks the family. He says, he didn't really do anything wrong. Like, he lied, and that's wrong. But can you drop the charges? And and Bill said, you know what? I will drop the charges against him if he promises to become a productive member of society, i.e. quit being a bum, line of people on buses. And Hussein accepts that. And the whole time, a boss, the director's like, oh, yes, a perfect happy ending for my story. Then the film comes together. This was a boss's goal. He ended up having Hussein and the family reenact everything that happened before. So it's a film slash documentary that's reenacted by everyone who was in it. And the movie is called Close Call. It's, a, it's an interesting idea that you have basically a true crime case involving everyone in it. Now, this is one of those few crimes that you could actually do that in. You wouldn't want to do this in a murder trial. You're like, hey, remember you used to love your son-in-law until he butchered your daughter? We want to reenact like three Christmases before the crime. Let's bring him. No, we're not going to do that. This worked perfectly. And to put a cherry on top of this happy ending, true crime documentary film, when Hussein wins the trial or doesn't end up being sentenced, who's waiting for him in a car outside the courthouse? Director Mosin Maklamboff. He drives Hussein to the family's house. They all sit around and chat. And that's in the movie too. That, that's, the, that's the stinger at the end of the credits. It's like the, you think it's a happy ending. And then Mosin's sitting in his car and it's raining. There's just a close-up on his face. And he goes, nobody impersonates me. And he cocks a gun and walks into the house. Then it just ends. It's a setup for Close Call 2 Endgame. Thought that was an interesting story, went on a little bit longer than I <laughs> anticipated, but I found it very fascinating. Now someone needs to make a movie about the movie Close Call. Let's see if we can inception this thing as far as we go. And I wonder what this guy's up to now. I didn't like to look into it. I don't know. Actually, it's funny. The story took place in 1990. I wonder what would happen to all these people by now. I know Mosin left Iran because, <laughs> because the government didn't like him that much, but... So hopefully everyone's doing well. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that sounded ominous. I'm just like, uh, I hope they're all alive. But unfortunately, we can't investigate that. <laughs> Rolf, call in that Carpenter copter. We are leaving behind Iran, and we are headed out to the Swiss Alps. <laughs> Snowing. 
got to navigate between the snowflakes. He's a really good pilot. That's actually possible. We went, we went, we went. Everyone's getting sick in the back seat, but it's okay. I want to not get snow on my car in a copter. It lands. We landed a bunch of snow. It was fruitless. It's covered in snow now. We're in the Western Alps. We're walking through. We're walking through the snow. We parked kind of far away from the lodge. Good job, Rolf. He's like, dude, you just told me to land in the Alps. We're walking through the snow. We're all getting super cold. We're all getting super weak. And then we all fall down. We all, we're all we all laying in the snow now. And we're about to die. This is, a, this is the last episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. And then out of the snow, we see something coming towards us. Walking with big old feet and stuff. I don't have a lot of time. I don't know why I'm building up this segment. The last story went on too long. It's a St. Bernard. It's a big old dog. He has a little cask around his neck, a little wooden barrel. And I'm like pushing out of the way. I'm like, I need the brandy. I need the brandy. Glug, 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 glug. That's the same story of the St. Bernards. I think most people know what they are. They're a, they are a dog breed that was bred by monks to rescue people. But is that true? Everything you know about St. Bernard's is wrong. You're like, Jason, I barely know anything about St. Bernard's. So now Rolf opens up the secret entrance that's built into the Swiss Alps. We're going to go into a nice, warm tunnel that leads into... Why am I building this up so much? We're in a room. We're in a room with a big old boardroom, and I have all of these charts and strings and tacks and everything tied up like a conspiracy theorist. And I turn to you and I go... Fact, Beethoven would have died in the Alps. <laughs> Where is this going? Checking your watch. Like, oh good, there's only 15 minutes left of this podcast. Fact, Beethoven would have died in the Alps. Beethoven is the stereotypical St. Bernard. He's a big old slobbery mutt. But he would have died in the Alps. The dogs were first bred in the 1660s. There was no St. Bernard dog before then. Monks at the great St. Bernard Pass in Switzerland begin breeding these large dogs. What the dogs would do is they would actually go out on their own. They were never trained. They would just wander through the wilderness looking for people. And if they found someone, they would lick them up, wake them up. I don't think, if I'm almost dead, I don't think a dog will lick me. It's going to wake me up. I'm going to need more than that. Well, that's why they carry the brandy. Or do they? They'll lick you. They'll try to wake you up. And if you're able to, they'll lead you back to the monastery or, or some form of shelter. If they can't rescue you, they run home, they get help. So they're actually very, very intelligent dogs. But they were bred to assist the monks, and then they were doing these rescue missions. But that's not Beethoven. That part of the story is real, but that's not Beethoven. What happened was between 1816 and 1818, massive avalanches were striking the region, and scores of these St. Bernard dogs were being killed. Now remember, this species did not exist outside of this monastery. So the monks go, listen, we have two choices. We can keep, uh, maybe the dogs aren't as smart as we thought. They keep getting crushed by avalanches. We can keep letting them run out or we can save the species. So they begin to crossbreed them with other dogs. But during this crossbreeding process, what happened was the dogs got bigger. The dogs got hairier. They got more sturdy, but they stopped being able to do rescue missions. The St. Bernard dog that was rescuing people that we think of was a lean dog. A very, very lean dog. The old ones were 80 to 100 pounds. The St. Bernards you know of, 180 to 290 pounds. Beethoven was a big old dude. He would have died in the Alps. The snow would have just frozen his fur. Fact. Like, Jason, are you just going to dispute St. Bernard fact? Yes, but it's leading up to somewhere. Fact. St. Bernard's did not carry brandy on their necks. It's a very common misconception. Because I'm drinking brandy as I turn and I'm like, let me take a little sip to get my next uh, story idea. Glug, glug, glug. They did not carry brandy on their necks. That was, a, that was like something that came out of literature. But what happened was people would come. To, you can visit the St. Bernard Monastery Hostel is what it actually is. But it's run by monks. You can go there today and you can visit this place and see these dogs that are still around. They have the dogs with little casks around their necks walking around. People are like, oh, that's so adorable. It's St. Bernard. Look how huge it is. Can it play the piano? And they're like, what? Did St. Bernard, did Beethoven didn't play the piano. The dog, not the player. He was just like a dog running around. Why did I think he could play the piano? Anyways, click, click, click. They're taking photos of these, non, these non-piano playing dogs. But they never had casks. That was a myth. 
what happened for years, people would come to the hostel, see these dogs walking around, and they're like, where are the casks? And the monks would have to spend five minutes each time going, no, 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 that was a legend that was started from some Looney Tune cartoon or some etching in a book. I want to see the casks. They had to have that conversation so many times. The monks are like, damn it. Let's just put casks on all the dogs. Let's just put them everywhere. There was one dog who apparently had some sort of vial on him. But that was only in like one source where they talked about his vial. And that may have been the source of where that story came from. Now, when you talk about St. Bernard's, there's two famous ones. There's Beethoven. And then there's Barry. Barry's the most famous of all St. Bernard's. He saved up to 40 people. His most famous rescue is caught in a wood etching where he saved a little kid. There's a little like kid hanging on his back. What happened was the dog came over, lum, 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 licked up the kid's face. Kid woke up, can't feel his toes, but he's awake now. He crawls onto Barry's back and Barry marches him back to the house. A very, very famous doggy and a very noble doggy. So good job, Barry. There's a memorial plaque for Barry at the Symmetra des Chains. Pet Cemetery in France. And it says he saved the lives of 40 people. He was killed by the 41st. Bitter snowy day. (laughs) Barry's walking through the snow. He sees a boot sticking out of the snow. He's like, oh, time to get to work. This is what Barry does best. He goes up to this dude. He starts licking his face. The dude he was getting licked is a French soldier who got lost. Now, he's out, he's cold, and he wakes up, there's something licking his face in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't know Barry's reputation. He doesn't have Facebook. He thinks it's a wolf, so he grabs his bayonet. (laughs) He makes that noise, too. He stabs Barry in between the ribs, killing him on the spot. And French dude gets up and goes, ah, ah, that is what the French do best, killing innocent dogs. Then I imagine he takes it back to the monastery and he's like, look at I killed your vicious wolf that's been preying on people. Barry! That's a lie! That is 100% not true. They have a plaque telling the story of Barry and it's not true. The Barry is real. He retired, dude. He like spent the rest of his time in burn. He, he retired. He's like sitting there with Mai Tais on the beach. He didn't get bayoneted by a French soldier. This, it's all lies. It's all lies. And to make things even worse, Barry's body is at a natural history museum in Bern, Switzerland. He's a, he's a national hero. He saved a bunch of people, right? But here's the problem. People were coming to see Barry, and he's not a St. Bernard. He is. He's one of the original St. Bernards. But he doesn't look like Beethoven. And you know people need to have that recognition thing. It's super weird. It doesn't look like they'd come there and they'd be like, what was that like a big greyhound or something? No, 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 that's one of the original St. Bernard's. Ah, it look, nothing like Beethoven. The people in Natural History Museum was like, oh, I wish that movie was never made. So what did they do to Barry? They could either, again, explain every five minutes, well, this is what St. Bernard's used to look like, or... They took Barry's body and broke its skull open and rearranged the skull to give it a bigger St. Bernard-shaped head of what you would expect a St. Bernard to look like. And they made him bigger. They made him taller. Put him back on display. Little cask on his neck. Everyone's like, ooh, a St. Bernard. Click, 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 click. So Jason... You say to me, as I turn around, now I'm smoking a clove cigarette in our smoke-filled room. You're like, Jason, please stop smoking in your conspiracy chamber. What do you have? What's your question? What's going on? You go, Jason, so is your conspiracy, your great St. Bernard conspiracy, that St. Bernard's that we know of today don't exist, and they bashed open this poor dog's head to please tourists? Well, no. That's all the setup for what I'm about to say, because I wanted to show a history of lies and deceit from the St. Bernard people. There's the story in the Swiss Alps of a classic cryptid called the Barbagazi. It's a little gnome type of guy. He's only about one to three feet tall. Some people say it's like a baby Bigfoot. Some people say their white fur that they're seen wearing is exactly that. They're wearing it. It's white fur clothes. They're more of a gnome than some sort of ape. But both parties agree they have massive feet, 
They love to ski down avalanches. Wee! Which I would too if I had massive feet. Their feet actually work like snowshoes, which is an interesting evolutionary quirk. Their name literally means frozen beard because they have icicles for a beard. But one of the details is when people have caught these things over the years, over the centuries, they'll bring them down and they'll die on the way. But then you're not just going to be like, let's give this guy respectful burial. You're going to be like, let's show them off to our friends. The icicles would melt and they would actually have a real beard underneath them. I was reading this article by Florent Barrere for a website called strangereality.blog. It's really cool. I just started getting into it, but it seems to be a really cool website. They're just talking about this Barbagazi, this little baby Bigfoot. And I came across an interesting note, which made me research the St. Bernard. It said that there were people in the Swiss Alps who believe that the St. Bernards never rescued anybody. That it's all made up. These travelers who are being rescued are actually rescued by the Barbagazi. Because even though they cause avalanches, they also tend to whistle and alert humans to avalanches. Also them going, wee, wee, probably is a good alarm as well. They actively try to help humans. They'll dig them out of the snow. There are stories of that. So there are people in the Swiss Alps who believe that the whole St. Bernard thing is a myth. There's dogs running around. Sure, they probably licked a couple people awake, but it was truly the Barbagazi who were saving these people. I take a seat at the conference table with you. All of us are seated there. Ladies and gentlemen, put your conspiracy caps on for a moment. They're underneath your chair. You can take it home with you. It's a gift. What if this phenomenon isn't simply about the Barbagazi? What if a ton of rescue efforts are aided? by the supernatural. How many times do we hear about searchers looking for a missing kid or a lost body or something like that, and then it shows up and people go, well, that's weird. We already searched that area. Now, sometimes, and and oddly enough, it's a few amount of times, sometimes, the killer then drops the body off at a place that's already been searched. For the most part, that doesn't happen. For the most part, the searchers just go, we must have missed it. What if there is a supernatural element? The person was not killed by supernatural means. The person was killed by a human. But it wasn't an inaccessible place. And there is some sort of supernatural force that then moved it to a location where it would be found. We've talked about before on this podcast the third man aspect. People up on mountains start hearing voices and seeing people that helps them move on. That's definitely... Most likely, I should say definitely, but that's most likely a supernatural thing. What if all of these things are supernatural? What if it's to the point that all of these like rescue ranger groups, not the cartoon, but you know, like people who who ride horses looking for people who are stranded, helicopter rescue teams up in the mountains, divers. What if it's all a cover? What if all of these dudes just sit at home, drink coffee all day? They're super jittery. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally rescued all those people. Rescued 40 of them. And then the 41st one stabbed me in the guts. People are like, what are you talking about? What if it's all a cover? What if it's all government-funded propaganda so we don't look into the truth? I actually have a friend who works mountain rescue in Mount Hood. But he's in on it, too. He's in on it, too. I never saw him. I never actually, he talked about walking up the mountain all the time, but I never saw him doing it. So he's in on it too. You have to show me a photograph, a time dated photograph of you on the mountain, friend. (laughs) Otherwise you're part of the conspiracy. What if this is true? Now, of course, I'm pushing it to the farthest extreme and saying all rescue operations are fake. But then you always have these weird feats of, of engineering where we had that Um, what was it, Deepwater Horizon started pumping in like millions of gallons of oil a day into the Gulf. And everyone's like, oh, crap, what do we do about that? They're a little more concerned about that, but they're like, oh, well, let's just put this concrete thing on. They worked on it. What if the whole time the government's like, hmm, how are we going to figure this out? There's a bunch of mermaids down there already, like, oh, lousy humans. Uh, 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 Sealing it shut. What happened to all that oil, by the way? What happened to all that oil? Fukushima. Remember, they're supposed to radiate all the oceans and we'd all be dead by now. We're supposed to be dead like in 2015. All the fish are dead. And then we all get irradiated, turn into mutants. Hopefully I'm a cool mutant turtle. Probably not. Probably just be one of the ones with all the tumors. What if the true rescuers in our world 
are supernatural. And the government would actually want to cover that up. You would want to cover that up because it would show that they had little to no control over really anything. They can sit and they can pass taxes and tell you where the gas main goes in your yard. But if all the life and death decisions were made by whether or not you got saved by a unicorn or a chupacabra, then what does the government have to do? What, what, what would the government be able to do other than just, you know, tell you what, where to go? I'd be like, I'm phone for the unicorn, bro. You saved my uncle's life. It sounds like a far-fetched theory, and it sounds like a joke, but there are people... It's, I, 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 I'm pushing it a little far. I'm pushing it a little far. But let's go back to the original thing. I do think it's interesting that there are people in that area who don't believe that the St. Bernards actually saved anyone. And we can look at all the times that we've been lied to about by St. Bernards. They don't play pianos. They don't, they've never played pianos. We can talk about all the times that we've been lied about St. Bernards. And then when they make this claim about them rescuing people and you have people in the area being like, nope, that's not what happened. <laughs> One time I saw two little gnomes dig a guy out and carry him home. Didn't see no dog. <laughs> two little guys when they're standing next to each other kind of took the shape of a dog in the snow and the flurry, but I didn't see a dog. Is it possible that our world is more ruled by supernatural than we think? And yeah, we have the story of like angels and demons and this eternal cosmic conflict. But I'm talking about just day-to-day stuff. Yesterday we talked about where stuff goes in your house and whether or not aliens take it. What if the reason why you're safe is because of not a guardian angel, but because there's some root seller elf you happen to build your house on top of and he really likes you, so he's keeping you out of harm's way. Or when tragedy does strike and people are concerned about finding someone's body, that it's really Bigfoot being like, oh... Poor child. (laughs) That got dark really, really fast. Let me change that. Oh, poor elderly man. Lived a good life, but still sad to Bigfoot. Bigfoot walks and he sets him down on like a grass. He could have taken him home, but you know, that's too obvious. Bigfoot sets him down on on the grass where the rescuers will find him instead of him being cramped up and rotting underneath some rock somewhere. Bigfoot like that gross. That might house me get rid of old man smell. Is it possible that rescue efforts are led not by man, but by creatures? We have one incident here, the Barbagazi, that we can say, possibly. And if we can put a pin in that story, doesn't that mean we should be able to take a closer look at all rescue stories to see if they also fit the same pattern of constant lies being told in about the so-called rescuers sorry barry i'm sure you were a good dog but maybe the creatures and the cryptids in the woods aren't necessarily our enemy maybe we just interpret them that way maybe it's propaganda from the rescue industrial complex who knows all i know is that saint bernards are not saint bernards that is the ultimate fur pill dead rapper radio <laughs> DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. Twitter is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. But I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great week, you guys. I'll see you Monday.